After studying this module, you shall be able to learn the importance of electroencephalography in the study of brain, learn the procedure and evaluation of the electrical stimulation of the brain, understand the procedure and evaluation of the deep brain stimulation, learn the procedures and evaluation of other techniques like cranial electrotherapy stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, electroconvulsive technique and vagus nerve stimulation method. Brain imaging is progressively becoming a suitable tool for both research and clinical care. A variety of imaging techniques now provide extraordinary sensitivity in visualizing the brain structure and functions from the level of individual molecules to the whole brain. Many imaging techniques are non-invasive, allow dynamic processes to be visualized and can monitor data along the continuum of time. Imaging is enabling researchers to identify neural networks involved in cognitive processes, understand disease pathways, recognize and diagnose diseases early when they can be most effectively treated, and determine how therapies work. In areas of biomedical research, imaging can provide a better understanding of a disease process that leads to the discovery of potential therapies. Different types of imaging techniques are used to reveal brain anatomy, physiology and biochemical actions of individual cells and their functions. The three main categories under which their functions are imaged are structural, functional and molecular. While many imaging techniques are used throughout the body, the descriptions provided here focus on their use in the nervous system, primarily the brain. These imaging techniques are transforming our understanding of how the brain functions, how immune cells function and how immune cells interact with the brain in health and disease. The potential target areas of the brain under research in this procedure are the cortex, thalamus, hypothalamus, basal ganglia, amygdala, hippocampus and the limbic system among others. There are two aspects of the use of electrophysiological research in the field of neuropsychology. Firstly, it is a tool to record the structure and the functions of the brain in times of health and disease. Secondly, it is a tool to stimulate the brain to effect certain treatments or cure for several pathological conditions. The electroencephalography is used primarily to understand the functions of the brain, whereas the other techniques mentioned below are primarily of the therapeutic use. Electroencephalography EEG The brain's electrical charge is maintained by billions of neurons. Neurons are electrically charged by proteins that pump ions across their membranes. Neurons are constantly exchanging ions with the extracellular fluid to maintain resting potential and to propagate action potentials. This process is known as nerve impulse conduction. When the waves of the ions reaches the electrodes on the scalp, the metal of the electrodes pick them up. Since metal conducts electricity, the difference in push or pull voltages can be measured by a voltmeter. Recording these voltages over time gives the electroencephalographs. The electric potential generated by an individual neuron is too small to be picked up by the EEG. Therefore, EEG always reflects the summation of the synchronous activity of thousands of neurons that have similar spatial orientation. If the cells do not have similar spatial orientation, their ions do not line up and create waves to be detected. 
neuronal activities from deep sources in, is more difficult to detect than currents near the skull. The EEG patterns have been linked with the stages of sleep behavior and with the detection of several pathological conditions of the brain. Electroencephalography is a non-invasive technique that senses electrical impulses in the brain due to neural activities using electrodes placed on the patient's scalp. The recording of conventional EEG represents changes in the electrical activity in the order of tens of million seconds and are used to monitor responsiveness, comma, and brain death locate areas of damage following head injury and investigate epilepsy. The spatial resolution of the EEG techniques is limited due to the layers of series brospinal fluid, skull and scalp between the electrodes and the current source in the brain. Consequently, the electrical potential distribution on the scalp is blurred and it is difficult to determine the location of regions of activity. The following figure shows electrodes planted for recording EEG from the scalp of the organism. High resolution EEG provides a numerical estimate of the electrical potentials near the cortex surface and it has been used as a tool in the study of cortical activation during external stimulation and cognitive studies. The electrodes only gather the impulses released by the brain and do not transmit any stimulus to the brain. However, EEG may be recorded in response to an external stimulus also. The neurologist may ask the patient to breathe slowly or quickly and may use visual stimuli such as flashing lights to see what happens in the brain when the patient sees these things. The brain's electrical activity is recorded continuously throughout the recording on spatial EEG paper. The EEG can de detect changes over milliseconds. Other methods of imaging the brain in action such as PET and functional magnetic resonance imaging have time resolution between seconds and minutes. Furthermore, the EEG measures the brain's electrical activity directly while other methods record changes in blood flow, for example SPECT, fMRI or metabolic activity, for example PET and NIRS which are indirect markers of brain electrical activity. The EEG can be used simultaneously with fMRI so that high temporal resolution data can be recorded at the same time as high spatial resolution data. The EEG records the aggregated synaptic activity of the postsynaptic potentials of cortical neurons. EEG can be recorded at the same time as MEG so that data from these complementary high time resolution techniques can be combined. A process of EEG, a standard EEG takes about one hour. The patient is positioned on a padded bed or in a comfortable chair to measure the electrical activity in various parts of the brain. 16 to 20 electrodes are attached to the scalp. The brain generates electrical impulses that these electrodes will pick up. No pain is involved. Sleep EEG. During a specialized sleep EEG, the patient will be placed in a room that encourages relaxation and asked to fall asleep while the brain's electrical activity is recorded. The sleep EEG will last about 2 to 3 hours. Ambulatory EEG during a specialized ambulatory that is moving from place to place or walking EEG the electrodes are placed on the patient's scalp and attached to a portable cassette recorder. The patient will be allowed to go home and resume normal activities while the EEG continuously records. The ambulatory EEG typically lasts 24 hours. The more relaxed a person is, the greater the amplitude and the lower the frequency of the waves. 
the lower the amplitude and greater the frequency the more likely it is that the person is an excited state eye and jaw movements can cause fluctuating electrical fields across the scalp thus subjects are requested to remain still and to minimize eye blinks or movements potential risks with eeg the spatial resolution is poor in comparison to other imaging techniques the patient may be asked not to take certain seizure or antidepressant medications one to two days before having an eeg this may make the person more prone to having a seizure which is exactly what the doctor would like to measure during an eeg the doctor may encourage things that stimulate seizures such as deep breathing or flashing lights so that he or she can see what happens in the brain during the seizures electrical stimulation of the brain esb this method involves insertion of electrodes into the brain of a living animal and sending of a weak electrical current into the brain to mimic a nerve impulse that is a false nerve impulse will make the brain react as if real impulse from sensory receptor has been received the esp was first used in the 19th century to study the brain localization of function following the discovery that nerves and muscles were electrically excitable stimulation of the surface of cerebral cortex was used to investigate the motor cortex in animals then neurosurgeons and neurologists stimulated the human cortex electrically to study the localization of functions of the brain the technique was improved by the invention of the stereotaxic method and by the development of chronic electrode implants that is using electrodes manufactured by straight insulated wire that could be inserted deep into the brain of freely behaving animals such as cats and monkeys this approach has been used to discover pleasure center in the brain and to awaken neurosurgical patients to investigate the motor and sensory homunculus the representation of body in the brain cortex according to the distribution of motor and sensory territories the following picture of the using the electrical stimulation method olds and milner observed that some animals seem to behave in a manner that increase the amount of intracranial stimulation that they received further investigation demonstrated that rats will press a lever as rapidly as 2000 times each hour to obtain electrical brain stimulation and they will continue responding at this rate for 24 hours or longer cut they will ignore other rewards such as water or food to continue working for electrical stimulation two photon excitation microscopy has shown that micro stimulation activates neurons sparsely around the electrode even at low currents up to distances as far as 4 mm away this happens without selecting other neurons much nearer the electrode tip this is because of the activation of neurons whether they do or do not have exons or dendrites that pass within a radius of 15 new near the tip of the electrode as the current is increased the volume around the tip that activates neurons exons and dendrite increases as with this the number of neurons activated also increases activation is most likely to be due to direct depolarization rather than synaptic activation strong electric currents may cause a localized lesion in the nervous tissue instead of a functional reversible stimulation this property has been used under neurosurgical procedures in a variety of treatments such as parkinson's disease focal epilepsy and psychosurgery sometimes the same electrode is used to probe the brain 
to find defective functions of the brain. The electrical stimulation of the brain, ESB, provides insight into the functioning of the brain but the problem in interpretation is that no single area of the brain is the only source of a behavior or emotion. Besides, the ESP provoked behavior is compulsive and stereotypical. It does not preferably mimic natural behavior. The ESP effects may depend on a multitude of factors depending on individual reactivity. The ESP does not induce a beneficial permanent change. Instead, it may produce only a transient emotional tranquility. Variants of electrical stimulation of the brain. A large number of techniques to electrically stimulate the brain have been developed. Most of them have been developed for therapeutic purposes. A few examples are described below. Cranial electrotherapy stimulation known as CES, deep brain stimulation also known as DBS, transcranial magnetic stimulation TMS, electroconvulsive technique ECT, vagus nerve stimulation VNS. A brief description of each one of them is as follows. Cranial electrotherapy stimulation CES Cranial electrotherapy stimulation is a psychiatric treatment in which a small pulsed electric current is applied across a patient's head. Some researchers and doctors claim that CES has beneficial effects in conditions such as anxiety, depression, insomnia and stress. The exact mechanism of action of CES is not well understood but it is assumed that CES reduces the stress that underlies many emotional disorders. It is thought to act as a system that will balance the deregulation caused by multiple physiological arousal systems during the states of high emotionality. This characteristic makes CES not addictive or habit forming. The pulse of electric current it is assumed increase the ability of neural cells to produce serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, DHEA, endorphins and other neurotransmitters. It is also linked with the decrease in the level of cortisol. After a CES treatment, patients are in an alert yet relaxed state characterized by increased alpha and decrease delta brain waves as seen through the electroencephalograph. The production of such neurotransmitters takes place in a balanced manner. It thus stabilizes the neurohormonal system of the organism. During CES, an electric current is administered to the hypothalamus. Besides, electrodes are placed on the ear at the mastoid near to the face. Computer modeling is carried out to understand the signals. It suggests that currents of similar magnitude may be induced in both cortical and subcortical regions. A comparison of the cortical and subcortical magnitude of stimulation can be interpreted for the study of arousal patterns under states of emotions. Deep Brain Stimulation DBS. Sometimes pathologies are related to the irregular electrical activity in deep circuits of the brain. The procedure of deep brain stimulation involves surgically implanting electrodes or wires in the brain that deliver electrical impulses to the brain tissue and consequently change this activity. This system of electrical impulses has three parts. They all are under the skin. The wires, leads or electrodes implanted in the brain. A battery pack or a generator or IPG that generates electrical impulses. Wires that connect the electrodes and the generator. The generator is carefully programmed for each patient to deliver electrical impulses to the carefully demarcated sites in the brain. The process is specifically monitored 
for every patient's unique brain anatomy, individual symptoms and specific disease so that everyone achieves some relief. The deep brain stimulation thus involves implanting electrodes in the specific areas in the brain and externally stimulating the electrodes to measure electrical activity of neurons and their electrochemical pathways. During deep brain stimulation surgery, the patient is awake under light sedation. It allows the neurosurgeon to monitor electrical activity in the brain during the procedure and to test other relevant conditions. This surgery is performed under two stages. Stage 1. The neurosurgeon makes a very precise roadmap of the brain with images obtained through an MRI or CT scan. Once the target areas are located, the surgeon implants the wires or electrodes in the brain. Patients usually stay in the hospital for one or two days after this surgery. Stage 2. The neurosurgeon implants the battery pack and connecting wires in the chest 10 to 14 days after stage 1. Patients are usually awake and can go home the same day. The generator that controls the electrical impulses in the brain is turned on two weeks after the implantation. The surgery relieves symptoms but it is not a total cure. It can also take up to six months of adjustments after surgery for some patients to achieve optimal results. Significant relief has been reported by patients of Parkinson's disease, dystonia, tremor, Tourette's disorder, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, among others. However, the procedure may be risky for older patients, those having hypertension and those suffering from seizures. Infection due to implanted devices may be another complication. In a few highly specialized research centers, neurosurgeons and cognitive scientists are undertaking DBS electrical imaging to begin to explore the neural underpinning of cognition. DBS electrodes transit signals from nearby cells when those cells are active in a specific task such as naming, responding to a happy or a sad face or involved in movement such as raising a finger. Potential risks of DBS the risk associated with the implant procedure for Medtronic DBS therapy may include serious complaints such as coma, intracranial hemorrhage, seizures, paralysis, cerebral spinal fluid, leakage and weakness. Some of these may be fatal. Medtronic DBS therapy may cause worsening of some symptoms associated with obsessive compulsive disorder and may cause changes in the mood. Stimulation parameters may be adjusted to minimize side effects and attain maximum symptom control. Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation TMS. Transcranial Magnetic Stimulation is a method in which invasion of the brain is not required. It causes depolarization or hyperpolarization in the neurons of the brain. In this procedure, electromagnetic induction is used to induce weak electric currents in the neurons. It is carried out by using a rapidly changing magnetic field which can cause activity in specific or general parts of the brain with little discomfort. It this allows for study of the brain's functioning and interconnections. Another variation of TMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, has been developed. The method of TMS uses a magnet instead of an electrical current to activate the brain. An electromagnetic coil is held against the forehead and short electromagnetic pulses are administered through the coil. The magnetic pulse easily passes through the skull and causes small electrical currents that stimulate nerve cells in the targeted brain region and because this type of pulse generally does not reach further than 2 inches into the brain, scientists have to 
carefully select which part of the brain will be targeted. The magnetic field is of about the same strength as that of magnetic resonance imaging scan. A repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation has been found to be effective in the treatment of disorders such as migraine, stroke, Parkinson's disease, diastonia, tinnitus and depression. This technique may also be used to map cortical functions in the brain such as identifying motor or speech areas. The path of this current is difficult to trace. The brain is irregularly shaped and electricity and magnetism are not conducted uniformly throughout its tissues. The magnetic field is about the same strength as an MRI and the pulse generally reaches no more than 5 cm into the brain unless using the deep transcranial magnetic stimulation. Another variant of TMS, deep TMS can reach up to 6 cm into the brain to stimulate deeper layers of the motor cortex such as that which controls leg, foot or hand movement. If TMS is applied at any part of the neocortex, nerve impulses will be generated in the neurons below their surface. If used in the primary motor cortex, it will produce muscle activity referred to as a motor evoke potential which can be recorded on electromyography. If used on the occipital cortex, phosphenes, which are the flashes of light, might be seen by the subject. In most other areas of cortex, the participant does not consciously experience any effect, but his or her behavior may be slightly altered. For example, slower reaction time on a cognitive task or changes in the brain activity may be detected while performing certain sensory motor tasks. TMS can be used to study damage from stroke multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, movement disorder, motor neuron disease and injuries and other disorders affecting the facial and other cranial nerves and the spinal cord. The TMS has been suggested as a means of assessing short interval intracortical inhibition SICI. Unlike TMS, Repetitive TMS is used as a therapeutic intervention rather than as a cortical mapping tool. In stroke patients with motor deficits, our TMS is used to try to restore the balance of excitation between motor cortices in each brain hemisphere. Changes in signals from the motor cortex can be associated with improvement in muscle movements such as raising a finger. Repetitive TMS produces longer lasting effects which persist past the initial period of stimulation. The RTMS can increase or decrease the excitability of the corticospatial tract depending on the intensity of stimulation, coil orientation and frequency. The mechanism of, the, of these effects is not clear though it is widely believed to reflect changes in synaptic efficacy akin to long-term potentiation LTP and long-term depression LTD. Electroconvulsive techniques ECT. It is a procedure to administer electric shocks to produce seizures in the brain for a fraction of a second to cure chronic conditions. The procedure has been substantially modified to minimize the intensity and extent of seizures produced in the brain. It is usually considered only after a patient's illness has not been improved after other treatment options such as antidepressant medication or psychotherapy. It is most often used to treat severe treatment resistant depression but occasionally it is used to treat other mental disorders such as bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. It may also be used in life-threatening circumstances such as catatonia, patient being suicidal or malnourished as a result of severe depression. Before ECT is administered, a person is given tranquilizers with general anesthesia. He is also given a medication called a muscle relaxant to prevent 
vehement movements that may occur during the procedure. Electrodes are placed at precise locations on the head. Through the electrodes, an electric current passes through the brain, causing a seizure that lasts generally less than one minute. It is assumed to produce changes in the chemistry and functioning of the brain. The patient's body shows no signs of seizure, nor does he or she feel any pain because patient is under anesthesia. From 5 to 10 minutes after the procedure ends, the patient awakens. He or she may feel extremely tired. After about 1 hour, the patient usually is alert and can resume normal activities. In the case of a depressed patient, ECT may be required about 3 times a week until the depression is overcome to some extent, usually within 6 to 12 treatments. The side effects associated with ECT are headache, upset stomach and muscle aches. Some people experience memory problems, but this difficulty usually disappears over the days and weeks following the end of an ECT course. Research has found that memory problems seem to be more associated with traditional type of ECD called bilateral ECT in which electrodes are placed on both sides of the head. Unilateral ECT in which the electrodes are placed on just one side of the head, typically the right side because it is opposite the brain's learning and memory areas, appears less likely to cause memory problems. Vagus nerve stimulation VNS the 10th cranial nerve, the vagus nerve, is stimulated in the procedure to stimulate certain areas which are served by this nerve. It works through a device implanted under the skin that sends electrical pulses through the left vagus nerve. The vagus nerve carries messages from the brain to the body's major organs like heart, lungs, intestines and to the areas of the brain that control mood, sleep and other functions. The method of VNS was originally developed as a treatment for epilepsy. However, it became evident using brain scans that it can also have effects on mood, especially depression. The pulses appeared to alter certain neurotransmitters associated with mood, including serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, and glutamate. In 2005, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, approved VNS for use in treating major depression in certain specified circumstances. A device called a pulse generator about the size of a stopwatch is surgically implanted in the upper left side of the chest. Connected to the pulse generator is a lead wire, which is guided under the skin up to the neck, where it is attached to the left side vagus nerve. Typically, electrical pulses that last about 30 seconds are sent about every 5 minutes from the generator to the vagus nerve. The duration and frequency of the pulses may vary depending on how the generator is programmed. The vagus nerve in turn delivers those signals to the brain. Normally, a person does not feel any sensation in the body as the device works, but it may cause coughing or voice may become hoarse while the nerve is being stimulated. The device can be temporarily deactivated by placing a magnet over the chest where the pulse generator is implanted if side effects become intolerable or before engaging in strenuous activity or exercise because it may interfere with breathing, the device can be reactivated by removing the magnet. Vagus nerve originates at the level of medulla and carries both sensory and motor fibers. The efferent fibers of the vagus nerve connect to the nucleus of the solitary tract. The solitary tract projects to the other locations in the central nervous system. Little is understood about exactly how vagal nerve stimulation modulates mood and seizure control. It has been hypothesized that alteration of norepinephrine release causes by projections of solitary tract to the locus coriolis elevated levels of inhibitory GABA 
and inhibition of aberrant cortical activity by reticular activating system may be the basis of the beneficial effects. Direct vagus nerve stimulation requires the surgical implantation of a stimulator device. On the other hand, the Cyberonix VNS devices consist of a titanium encased generator about the size of a pocket watch with a lithium battery to fuel the generator, a lead wire system with electrodes and an anchor tether to secure leads to the vagus nerve. An incision is made in the upper left chest and the generator is implanted into a little pouch on the left chest under the clavicle. A second incision is made in the neck so that the surgeon can access the vagus nerve. The surgeon then wraps the leads around the left branch of the vagus nerve and connects the electrodes to the generator. Once successfully implanted, the generator sends electric impulses to the vagus nerve at regular intervals. In order to avoid negative side effects on the heart, the left vagus nerve is stimulated. Other variable devices are being tested and developed by that involve transcutaneous stimulation and do not require surgery. These devices are similar to TENS, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation devices that are often used for pain management. The method of transcutaneous vagus nerve stimulation TVNS allows the stimulation of the vagus nerve without surgical procedure. Electrical impulses are targeted at the auricular ear at points where branches of the vagus nerve have cutaneous representation. The method has been found to be useful in the treatment of epilepsy as well as for the management of pain. There may be complications such as infections from the implant, surgery or the device may come loose, move around or malfunction which may require additional surgery to correct. Long term side effects are unknown. Other potential side effects include voice changes or hoarseness, cough, neck pain, breathing problems or swallowing difficulties. Electrophysiological recordings are important measures of the structural investigations of the brain. Electroencephalogram is inductive of normal and pathological conditions of the brain. In cranial electrotherapy stimulation, a weak electric current is applied across the patient's head which has beneficial effects in anxiety, depression, insomnia, etc. In deep brain stimulation, the electrodes are implanted in the brain which deliver electrical impulses and change its activity. In transcranial magnetic stimulation, Electromagnetic induction is used to induce electrical currents in the neurons. Through electroconvulsive technique, seizures are produced in the brain which affect chronic conditions of depression and others. In vagus nerve stimulation, surgically implanted pulse generator in the chest produces impulses in the brain. Thank you.